I know, and you know, this craze on NAD right now is out of control. And I don't think people have any sort of grasp whatsoever about taking NAD and the need for NMN as opposed to NAD. Let's just talk about importance of NAD and then why people are so misguided right now on taking straight NAD and what they need to be doing. NAD is fundamental to mitochondrial function, and we all know why, how important mitochondria are after this conversation. Right. So as you age, your NAD levels drop linearly with time. And we have less NAD, you can make less electricity, less heat, and less longevity compounds in your cells. So there's a clear case for raising NAD. And I've been taking NAD precursors for 25 years. The first one was niacinamide, which is a form of niacin. And then NR, nicotinamide riboside, came out. And I've been taking that for a long time. That's a company called Elysium. I've had David Sinclair on the show a couple of times. And on the Human Upgrade, just actually earlier this week, I interviewed a guy named Lenny Guarante, who has 40 years of experience working with NAD. And so nicotinamine riboside is kind of step one of raising your NAD levels. And then there's nicotinamide mononucleotide, or NMN, which is the second way, or I guess third way of raising your NAD levels. And the other thing you can do is you can do NAD IVs. And I popularized these like in 2015, they're $1,000 a pop, takes two hours and you feel like you're going to die. Someone's standing on your, your chest. It does improve performance. It's just very expensive and it doesn't raise levels in the cells as much as supplementation with a mixture of NMN, NR, and, and, uh, and niacinamide. So there's various companies I've worked with who make these kinds of formulas and some of them are better than others. Um, and the, I think the first major company to this was Elysium. Um, I do a lot of work with Qualia, um, Qualia NAD plus is a good product. And I like NMN a lot and I like mixtures of precursors and I like it when they pair it with some antioxidants to block immune activation that can happen as a side effect of raising NAD. The specific compound is called CD38. Yes, yeah, some people, they raise NAD and then they, they feel good for two months and they start getting weird inflammatory stuff. That's because some inflammatory cells eat all your NAD if you don't block them. So if you're taking appropriate antioxidants or they're built into your formula, that's a good strategy. But raising your NAD is necessary as part of a longevity or cognitive performance um, strategy just in general. So with the, the C38, because I'm... I'm using uh, Wonderfeel and they have resveratrol in there and I believe like olive olive extract and doesn't that address the CD38? Wonderfeel is a great brand. I, I, don't, I could have easily mentioned them there uh, as well in that list. I, I guess I was going linearly from back in time. Yes, resveratrol is one way to do it and having you know, highly active resveratrols there. The olive polyphenols are fantastic. So many people are saying, oh, I'm going to drink olive oil every day. It's the single most important thing. It's bullshit. Two tablespoons a day, 30 mils to 50 mils of olive oil is associated with increasing your longevity and it's good for you. More than that, you push up your oleic acid numbers and when your oleic acid is excessive, your body oxidizes omega-6 fats much more easily through something called D5D and D6D. So olive oil overdose doesn't work. We tried that in the 90s and learned. And what does work is at least half your calories coming from healthy saturated fats. The rest primarily monounsaturated, and you can't avoid some omega sixes, and you don't need to. They're they're essential. They just need to be five or ten percent undamaged. So you can take olive oil polyphenols without having to drink two gallons of the stuff a day. Right, and olive oil polyphenols like hydroxytyrosol, that are relatively little known. Those are really important. And by the way, when you read Headstrong, my book from geez, that was a few years ago, hydroxytyrosol is one of my recommended mitochondrial supplements. So there you go. There's your Wonderfield connection. Love it, man. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's another one that I started and I really started to learn more about NAD and pairing it with mitochondria, like you said. And when they go hand, you understand how they go hand in hand, you realize the importance of addressing both areas. And so definitely, well, I know we're getting closer to the end. So there's a few things I want to talk to you about. One, let's get into talking about oatmeal. And I, I, I warned Ben about this when we talked, I said the oatmeal mafia is coming for us, dude, because we're blasting it. Now I spent like the last 15 years eating oatmeal seven days a week, literally. 
And once I learned that it was horrible for you and I stopped, I felt a thousand times better. And then I started wearing a CGM and seeing the, the spikes and going, man, what the f is going on here? So let's talk about that. Why is oatmeal not good for you? And why is this going to piss so many people off like you've already done in the past, which I found hilarious because they weren't grasping what you were saying. But I want to know why it's bad and why, why it's, aside from the glyphosate, which I think should be obvious, why else is it bad? It's not really bad. Bad. One of the things that's made humans the dominant species on the earth is that we could survive on all kinds of food. Here's what's happened. The people who own the slaves or control the peasants, we're talking thousands of years ago, the kings, the queens, the Egyptian, whatevers, they ate the meat, the butter, the fish, the cheese, even the wine, which probably wasn't good for them, but who knows. And they fed the peasants the brown rice the oatmeal, the porridge, gruel is what we called it. This is useful because it has enough energy to go plow the fields because it has calories, but it's low in nutrients and it's not good for you in many different ways. And we go into what those are, but it's good enough to feed the peasants so they can do the work so I can have the cheese. That means it's become like soul food. And people get so weird and religious because of their mitochondrial food connection like, oh, this is soul food. These are the, this is the food of my European peasant roots. Like, get over yourself, dude. Look at what it does to your blood sugar. Oatmeal? Dude, have Ben and Jerry's. It'll have less of an effect. And it's got good fat in it. And by the way, Ben and Jerry's is not a clean brand by a long shot. There's much better brands of ice cream. And I'm not saying you should eat either one of them. But if you have continuous glucose monitoring, oatmeal is terrible. And if you do overnight oats, which is even stupider mm -hmm. because oats contain anti-nutrients and anti-nutrients, he at least gets rid of some of those things. So right. you have the blood sugar effects, they're quite often, because they're a grain, there's mold mycotoxins that are in them. But worst of all, they contain avenin, which is a protein very similar to gluten that causes inflammation and leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And often they're contaminated with gluten, which probably isn't going to affect most people unless you truly have celiac. But if I get very much gluten at all from American gluten sources, it wrecks my gut. And I know it. I can eat European gluten. So there are issues there, but that may not be the thing. But avenin is not gluten, but it does the same thing by poking holes in your gut. The other thing that I wrote about in the book before this most recent one is phytic acid. And phytic acid blocks mineral absorption. They bind, it binds to zinc, magnesium, iron, calcium. So you have these poor vegans. I was a devout vegan, a devout raw vegan. So I'm talking about myself here when I was obese and desperate. Well, look at this. This plant has all these minerals in it. My spinach has iron. The anti-nutrients that are present, which is phytic acid and something called oxalic acid, which isn't as high in oatmeal. It doesn't matter if there's minerals in your plants, if you can't absorb them because the plants are actively sucking minerals out of your bones. There you go. That's why overnight cold oats are even worse than cooked oats, but they both contain high levels of phytic acid. How do I know about this? Because I run a regenerative farm and I study what animals eat as well as what humans eat. And when you feed high phytic acid grains to chickens or cows, their hooves fall off, their beaks don't form. And these are animals that are designed to be able to eat phytic acid. Humans can't break this down. We don't make phytase, which is the enzyme that breaks it down. So farmers will add phytase to animal feed so the animals can eat things higher in phytic acid than they're supposed to. But then they'll give humans that. And what does it do? It makes us have osteoporosis. It gives us mineral deficiencies. Guess what happens when your minerals don't work? Your mitochondria don't work. I make two supplements with Subgrade Labs, which is uh, part of one of my companies that I focus on. They're the least sexy longevity supplements, but the most broadly applicable. One of them is called Vitamin Dake. You can go to vitamindake.com and the other one's called Minerals 101. Oh, and then you drink Danger Coffee. There's 22 bucks worth of trace and ultra trace minerals in every bag of the coffee. The coffee's 25 bucks a bag because of it and it's really good coffee without mold in it. Why? Because if you just get all the minerals your body needs and you have the fat-soluble vitamins at the same time which guide the minerals in, then your exercise will work, then your meditation will work. Even your NAD pathways work better. So like the least sexy vitamin dake and Minerals 101, it's not timeline. It's not wonderful. 
it's just critical and it's affordable and it's the broadest applicable thing. I'd, I'd probably make more money if I did some fancy longevity, whatever, but I have so many companies I work with who I support at the conference. You guys do this cool stuff. I want to get the basics to everybody. And if I put it in your coffee, that's awesome. But that's why I do it the way I do because oats and kale and almonds and spinach and all these superfoods, they are sucking your minerals. And if you said, well, I'm going to be even healthy, I'm going to go to steel cut oats instead wow. of old oats. They contain more lectins and they contain oxalates more than rolled oats. And if this is consistent in every kind of grain, brown rice is for very, very poor people. Every rice eating country eats white rice preferentially because the outer part of the rice that has all the fiber, it also has all the arsenic and all the lectins and it's not good for you. But if you're the lowest of the peasants, there's more calories in the lining of the rice. So they'll give you all the toxins so you can have the calories. And if you can afford it, you eat the white rice, which has carbs, not a lot of nutrients. Rice isn't a nutrient source. It's an energy source, right? And then you eat a little bit of meat with it. There's your nutrients. There's your protein. There's your fat, right? And you go to wheat. The peasants eat brown bread because they couldn't afford to throw away the brown part that had all the lectins and all the oxalates. White flour has almost no oxalate. Whole wheat flour has huge doses that cause kidney stones. Yes. Right? 70% of kidney stones are caused by plants and right. a lot of these superfoods. And you get these influencers who just don't have a clue the way I was in my late 20s eating. <laughs> I've been there. I shattered three teeth from green smoothies and being a vegan because I was sucking my minerals out. Kale, spinach, chard, almonds, and sweet potatoes, which I didn't, I, I recommended those as being better than other things. I talked about oxalates in the Bulletproof Diet, but I didn't control it for them as strongly as I should have. And you eat those when you're young, it builds up over time and it makes you systemically weak from a mitochondrial level, from a bone level. You do not want to do that. So what do you do? Get rid of the brown parts of your grains. Blanch your nuts if you're still going to eat nuts. Eat peely nuts and macadamia nuts. Those are really the only two safe nuts, maybe a few walnuts here and there. That's what you do. And the rest of the stuff, yeah, it tastes good. I don't care. <laughs> like, it, I don't like it. It doesn't taste good. I'm like, are you an adult? Like, oh, is, does heroin taste good? Then I guess you have heroin. Like, don't be dumb. And stop getting offended by a fact about a food. Like, it's like you owe it something. I just don't get it, man. It's like when I found out and I learned, I was like, well, one more thing that's got to go. Let's make a change, you know? I've been really doing a deep forgiveness practice on one food and I just haven't been successful. It's on kale. Like kale is not food and it keeps trying to pretend like it's food. And I'm getting triggered by this, Dylan. I, I need help. 